Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. All right, today we have an awesome, kind of inspirational thing that is a little bit off book for us, but a totally exciting for me personally approach to like entrepreneurialism and stuff like that, which is we have Colin who is with him and his wife are the owner of a couple boutique inns and they kind of got their start doing real estate and buying, fixing up historical homes and leveraging that to do what they're doing now, which is pretty cool stuff. And um, I love these kind of stories. I don't know if you've ever heard the podcast, Josh, called uh, Bigger Podcasts or mm. Bigger Pockets. Sorry. It's a <laughs> podcast called Bigger Pockets Podcast, oh. which is a lot like the what you're about to listen to is this kind of success story of what it took to to grow your portfolio over time and leverage that into a new kind of lifestyle for yourself. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's inspiring yeah. stuff. Yeah. Colin Crossman and he, man, their story about like the intertwinedness of like romance and dating. And I won't marry you. I won't buy a house with a guy I'm not married to. And that's, <laughs> that thing's just, I mean, I was, yeah. I, I wanted to cry. It was deep. And that's nice. Yeah. Was, and if you guys are in Cary or if you're in Raleigh and you're can drive to Cary, they're yeah. uh, the owners of the Maiden Inn, which is a fantastic place that you should check out. Don't forget that T, Maiden Inn. <laughs> Maiden Inn. Maiden Inn. Don't Why'd you it, say Kevin? it when you said it like that? It sounded dirty. What? The Mating Inn. Mayton. Mayton. M-A-Y-T-O-N. All right, we need, to, we need to jump into this episode. All right, everyone. <laughs> let's check it out. Colin Crossman. Don't miss this stuff. Subscribe today. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us on this week's episode of The Guys Who Do Stuff, where we help you get unstuck, tell a better story, and have a good answer to the question, what are you doing today? I'm Joe. And I'm Josh. And, to, oh. and who are you? <laughs> yes, you did it. That's perfect. <laughs> Somebody finally caught the cue. So today on the show, we have Colin Crossman. Thanks for being here, man. Sounds great. I'd love to be here. <laughs> yeah, welcome. We're happy to have you here. So Josh wanted to start with like an awkward question. I think you should. <laughs> who is Colin Crossman? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I was, uh, uh, was born up north in uh, two, uh, 78, and uh, my family moved around a whole lot. My dad was a uh, uh, corporate man, worked for a uh, family company. Where up uh, north? Cleveland. Cleveland, Cleveland. okay. My whole I'm Midwestern. Yeah. I'm from Michigan. Nice. I got family for everywhere from Pittsburgh to Chicago. Mm. So, hmm. I lived in Mississippi for a little while. I did too. Oh, yeah. I spent like four years in Corinth. Okay. We were in Jackson. Jackson. Okay. And then uh, upstate New York. No. Okay. Nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was in nothing. New York City for seven years. Huh? Nothing there. But not upstate. Yeah. New, Utica area. It's different. And then uh, down into Greensboro, my, my um, father took on um, managing a furniture factory in High Point. Mm -hmm. uh, it closed down. He bought it and uh, uh, restarted it under. Uh, as a family business. And uh, that was in late eighties. And then uh, they just retired February of this year. Oh, okay. So it's been a long, long road. But, yeah. uh, and you're currently, so if you're listening and you're in our listenership, which is the triangle, you might know Colin because him and his wife, it's Deanna, right? Yes. Okay. Him and his wife, Deanna, they own a couple boutique local inns and restaurants that are awesome. One being the King's Daughters up in Durham. And then the, the more recent one, which has been there for how long you guys been in business now? Five years? Oh, no, in, in, the one in Cary is the one in three Cary. years. Three years. The Maiden Inn, which yep. is uh, Josh and I go there all the time. We have a meeting that happens there once a week. We, meet, we meet every Monday morning. It's a fantastic place. And they got a great bar um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a fantastic restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, I remember it was about a year ago. Right when you guys were, uh, it was probably two years ago, but my wife and I lived real close to it, but our anniversary was coming up. So I called up and asked if you guys had like a romance package or something like that. And you were really nice and gave me like a really nice deal. <laughs> and so we got to spend uh, the our anniversary weekend in the maintenance and it's fantastic. Ooh, hotel, man. The do, rooms are great. Do you have a heart shaped bed? <laughs> I, we'd, we'd have a circular bed. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> That was not the one we were in. No circular bed for us, but I'm digging that. Square, that, one, that square was good. That's the, Waldo Root House in the back, the uh, oh. the historic house that's uh, on the site. That one has uh, 
a circular bed and a huge tub and a two-sided fireplace and a massive wall. It's a beautiful, it's the bridal cottage. That's beautiful. And the maintenance is in, I have to say this, I love saying this, historic downtown Cary. Mm, historical. Yeah, let's differentiate where yeah. it Cary. It Cary's a big place. Yeah. I should be clear that maintenance itself is not historic, although a lot of people come in and said, how long has this been here? No, yeah. it, it's a completely new building, but we built it so that it would fit with the historic character of downtown Cary. Yeah. And, uh, uh, just yeah, I think you guys it. did a great job because it's a big old building in the middle of downtown, but it looks like it's been there. I know, right? And there's mirrors and colors and all short, sorts of beautiful yeah. yeah, aesthetic. That's one of the nice things you can do with a boutique hotel is that you can be a little more crazy because... Um, you don't, you're not, you're not constrained by the, the, uh, pips or the, um, uh, requirements of a, of a chain where uh, like Marriott, they all look relatively similar because there's a limited right. palette that they can choose from. Well, we can do whatever we want. Mm. And, uh, uh, one of our yeah, that has like a, almost a bed and breakfast vibe yeah. to it, and that's what we we always started with. King's Daughters was a was a it, it's a boutique hotel because it's large, but it, it's also classified as a large bed and breakfast. We have seventeen rooms, and they're all different. And one of those rooms is this uh, like deep purple. We were very worried that this room would never get rid of <laughs> no, it. was like basically my, one of our most popular rooms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, I know like if I ever look for a bed and breakfast, I am looking for the weirdest room that I want to stay in. <laughs> like when you see the, have you ever been to a bed and breakfast and you're looking at the website and you're like, yeah. regular, 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 well, that one's weird. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's try and get that. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you guys explore color palettes and what those mean and translations of colors and all that stuff? I mean, well, I, I believe um, my wife did that with, um, our interior designer, mm -hmm. who is a uh, Madge Megliola from Greensboro. Mm -hmm. My parents uh, knew her from the furniture company. Um, they, uh, she is uh, very, very good. And she just handled everything. Um, of course, she ran it by us and uh, we said yes, no. But usually we just said, you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious. I was wondering who was the designer because you guys, your stuff has a really kind of I don't know, but it has a look. It's not an eclectic look. I can't find the, it hmm. feels like watching like a great old movie, like fifties and sixties yeah. kind of a it's, atmosphere. Yeah. It's an art deco, but it's, um, yeah, as, that's the word. I'll you know it. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just say what, uh, what, I, what I was um, told to say about the, about the look, which is it's late period art deco, um, with, uh, with the early period art deco in, uh, in a couple rooms in the King's daughters, but the rest of it is late period art deco, which kind of, I, I believe it melds into Art Nouveau, um, mm. but I'm, I, eh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like whatever you say, interior designer. Well, I see it in <laughs> magazines around town. So, you know, when you see, you know, models posed and different clients using the maiden in, it's, yeah. it's special and it, it's, set, it's set apart. It well, is. I'm really excited to ask you a bunch of questions because I'm curious, uh, doing a little bit of research. I think you guys got a really fun story and, um, I really want to start by just giving like a quick overview. This is what I know from looking at you online. Right. So you can, you can set the record straight if any of this is off, but uh, some of it, I think I found on your guys' website, which uh, hopefully is pretty accurate. Yeah. That <laughs> Rhea, what's that? Rhea what's Hospitality. That? Rhea Hospitality. Thank you. Um, so you guys, you and your wife, Deanna, you guys started dating in the midst of both of you guys kind of sharing a passion, which is historic home remodeling yeah um like yeah. but you guys came to the independently of each other you were you were both oh actually if you want the full story um i do we full. um <laughs> i she i was uh just I, I hope it's like the classic story where like i wasn't into it but she was and i wanted to date her <laughs> so all of a sudden i got real into home well, remodeling. It's, it, it's it's uh, not that far off of that. But, uh, so I, I had come back from working in, uh, I was, I was attempting to be a patent attorney. I was an attorney by trade and didn't, um, I went to law school. Okay. Uh, timing did not work out. Went to do, a uh, uh, was getting a master's of engineering at Duke after the law school and, uh, did a summer, uh, in Portland, Oregon, came back, realized I'm not going to go out to Portland. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for this job that's available after I graduate, which is a professor job. And I, uh, ended up living, um, with a friend of mine for six months while I was looking for a house, bought a house. Turns out that the house was across the street from Deanna. She had done the same thing. She was a graduate student. She, uh, she came to Duke, uh, decided to buy a house, fix it up. This is 
2005, 2004. And so both your houses were in like a historic district of Durham. They, well, they were in Walltown, which is a, uh, I mean, all, but all the houses that we, uh, I believe were 1930s, 40s and 50s vintage. Okay. Um, well, those uh, come with a set of problems. Oh, that. they do. And uh, <laughs> uh, understand that uh, 2004, 2005 Durham is a little different than today in Durham. Um, my first house was $45,000, two blocks from Duke. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, it was, it was insane. Um, there's a, a lot of, it had a lot of problems. It had a, had had a small fire in it. Um, so it needed a, quite a bit of work, but it was still. But the price was right. Part, the price was right. Yeah. <laughs> so $45,000. How many square feet was the house? 1800. Wow. That's a good deal. On a fifth of an acre. So a tiny, tiny little lot. Yeah. Big house. Um, but you know, two, two and a half blocks from Duke walking. Yeah. It's, it, you couldn't, you, th those houses now you can't get for less than 200, I don't think. Mm. Um, now that they're all fixed up, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so I had bought that house across the street from her. She saw me, um, quote, working on the house. Yeah. And, you were, uh, yeah let me get, I just saw you with a hoe in the yard. <laughs> shirtless. Shirtless yeah. summertime. <laughs> Hi, would you like some sweet tea, darling? <laughs> well, so she comes over and says, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to break yourself, your house, or both. Nice. So she had a background. Her father was in construction. She had a background. She knew what she was doing. So she takes me over and I said, okay, fine. You teach me. I'll bring you food. <laughs> wow. It's a great deal. Um, we were dating two weeks later. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then, uh, so we had my house, her house, her house was actually her second house. And because I'm a massive idiot, I literally was, I bought the first house and two weeks later I bought a second house. But then again, at $45,000, <laughs> like, um, so between the two of us, we had four houses. And uh, then the house that was sort of directly across the street from me and next to her was, um, uh, went up for sale. And, uh, and I said, we should buy that. She said, I don't buy houses with boyfriends. Mm. So I said, okay, hold on a minute. Walked outside, called her mother. I had already gotten the ring commissioned, everything. I had already told her parents I was planning on this, but so I walked back in and I said, okay, you ruined the surprise. <laughs> I don't want to get married, <laughs> but the ring wasn't ready. Uh, I was going to propose on a trip we were taking to Mexico about two weeks later. Of course, the ring wasn't even ready then. So she actually ended up trying on and seeing the engagement ring that I designed before I saw it. So she got, her, uh, she got her, uh, her, uh, back at me. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So how long were you guys dating before you guys got engaged? Nine months or so, six, seven Seven, eight, nine months. Seven, eight, like nine months. Mm -hmm. So one of your, one of the things I found said that during the courtship process, and we talked about this a little bit upstairs, you guys had uh, remodeled essentially. Is it is that the right word or restored? What's the right word uh, for historic home? Um, remodeled and restored. Uh, and there, you're always going to be doing some of both. Yeah. 18 historic houses. Were they all in Durham? All of them in Durham, all of them in different parts of Durham. Uh, some in Walltown, some in um, Northgate Park, some in East Durham. Um and, uh, so they, they were just scattered around Durham. We basically, once we got that fifth house that I was telling you about that sort of got us to the engagement, we, uh, the caddy corner house to all of this went up for sale. And so basically next to me and across from her and we wanted that one too, because we uh, understand back in nine, uh, 2005, uh, Walltown was still a pretty transient or transitional neighborhood. Mm -hmm. it, uh, there was, a uh, still quite a bit of crime and this house that was now up for sale was, uh, pretty much the worst on the block. And we wanted to buy it as a defensive measure so that somebody else wouldn't just keep it. Oh, that I got shape. You. So we picked that one up, uh, or we tried to and found out that some, somebody had already put an offer on it, but, me being an attorney and working at the law school, I had access to a lot of tools. So I figured out that that house was part of a, uh, an estate. So somebody had died and had a, had a property. So I looked and sure enough, there was a whole bunch of other property. So we said, uh, why don't you show us the other stuff that's in the, uh, don't accept that offer yeah. yet and show us the other stuff. I've heard of this, this yeah. idea of like, um, just making an offer on an entire bundle. Yep. Yeah. So that's what we did. Uh, they were planning on selling it off piecemeal and we got, we got hold of, uh, we figured out that it wasn't, that it was a bundle. And then we, uh, toured everything. And at the end of the day, I said, okay, 
we'll buy a, we'll buy everything for 10% under tax value. And, um, after I picked my wife and the real estate agent up off the floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, yes, yeah, it, so, it sounds like a lot, but understand that this is Durham in 2005. And so all of those houses total was like $700,000. Mm. Um, so how many houses was it? Or what was, what was all in the bundle? That was, um, that was about, I think 25 units. So um, a blend of single family and uh, duplex. So that brought us up to, uh, I believe it was 18 roofs. Wow. So 18 structures with like, I think a total of about 25, 26 units. Yeah. Um, and before that you were at. Oh, uh, we were at five. Five. <laughs> That's a big jump, man. Yeah. Mm. That's a big we, jump. We like big jumps. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what's your, uh, what's been your strategy with the kind of, cause I think a lot of people, I know I am. I'm fascinated with the, the kind of, uh, the passive income of rental property, the, the appeal of it growing over time and, and accumulating. And there's so many strategies and so many different ways to do it. I'm curious where you guys, when you started out, did you have like, this is the way we're going to do it. We're buying hold. And then you changed your mind after time. Like, has it always just been kind of piecemeal? Have you learned any kind of tips and tricks? Well, it's always been uh, for, so the the way you make a lot of money in rental property is you never sell. Um, now other people would have a different view on that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would say that we did not we did not follow through with that plan because we sold all of our rental properties. Um, but we did it to buy the hotels. Right. Um, but the uh, which I'm really excited to talk about. Mm -hmm. That's more like you kind of leverage what you were doing yeah. for that's, changing games a little bit, and that's and that's that's <clears throat> that's one thing you can absolutely do. But um, what the 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 way you if you're gonna if you're not gonna sell, the way you make money on rental properties is you manage them yourself. So it's less, it's a little bit less passive. You can turn it into passive, yeah. But understand that you're gonna be you're gonna be giving up a good chunk of that to right. a property manager. Now, most property managers charge, what's the percentage? Like 5% for a property manager? Five to 10. Five to 10%. And then um, usually, uh, I believe the what, what, for the brief period that we did it, I had a real estate license and, and we did it for briefly. We charged 10% um, and uh, first month's rent. So we got, we got the first month's rent is kind of like the marketing and then 10% ongoing for managing it. Okay. So you guys also did property management, you're saying? Uh, just for a couple of friends. Okay. Um, it was not something we wanted to get into. Uh, after doing it for one or two people, we realized, no, no, we can do it for ourselves. But be, being, uh, be, basically being employees, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys were always really hands-on with all of your properties. Oh, yeah. I mean, when a good chunk of the renovations, uh, anything that didn't require permits was us. Yeah. Like, like demo that was all me is durham yeah. uh is durham less stringent about permits than carry like oh no you still have to have all the permits but there's a there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do without a permit yeah like uh, uh, as long as you are uh like if, for instance inside of a structure mm -hmm. if you're if you're going to be um anything that requires paint floors you know cosmetic right. you're not changing the structure you're not doing plumbing electrical you don't need a permit for any of that. Right now, exteriors different. So you guys put in a lot of sweat equity and stuff yeah. like that. And that's that's the other way <laughs> you do. It. Similarly, you don't want to have a property manager if you can help it. You also want to do as much as you can. Yeah. Um, it does help if you have a license or have or, or have a really close friend or business partner with a license, especially something like electrical, because you can save a ton of money. We had uh, we had a close friend who had an electrical license, so that made us uh, made things a lot easier right. for us. But, um, I bet finding a good person that you can trust makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah. And, um, the, the finding somebody that you can have lots of repeat business with, uh, and that they has reasonable rates and is good at their job that that's gold. Yeah. And, uh, also very hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the trades I and mean, that's, that's where I feel like I get out of my, out of my comfort zone. I'm pretty handy with most stuff, but then it's like when it turns into something that should be like a profession, like a trade, mm -hmm. I kind of try to know my limits, but I often get myself in trouble. Yeah. And as, as, uh, I mean, generally speaking, um, if uh, a lot of the stuff in a residential, in a commercial context, that's different, but in a residential context, if you just sit there and think about it and read up, yeah, you can usually do it exactly right. It's when people get lazy, Right. Professionally, the whole, basically what, what the, the trades and the professions teach you is how not to get lazy. Yeah. Right. So if, uh, and actually, actually how to know all of the little details. 
um, that could come up. But yeah, there's a lot you can just YouTube and get real good oh, at yeah. nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course that's, that's also very dangerous because you could not realize you're about to yeah. walk into something. That's <laughs> so, um, so you guys were at, you said 18 properties, 25 doors. So what, what made you guys want to, so I know a little bit about uh, the King's daughters mm -hmm. and how it was a, I think it, the way it was phrased, a recently shuttered women's retirement yes. home. And so, but you guys kind of went in, it had, what was it about it that was like, oh man, this, we got to do this. Well, so this, were you guys getting bored just flipping regular houses? Not so much, <laughs> not, not so much bored as, um, like I said, we started in 2005 and first set of houses was extremely cheap. It started yeah. to get, we did, we had a couple more small acquisitions after that big one. Um, and so this is coming up in the housing crisis. This is, uh, we, we started talking to the, to the owners of the King's daughters in 2000 and mid to late 2007. Mm. And then we bought it. Oh, so what kind of luck you guys got out right before the housing crisis <laughs> we, switched gears. <laughs> we, we sold a good chunk of our, of our real estate, uh, in 2007 and eight, um, in order to transition to the King's daughters, right. which we closed on in July, on July 2nd of 2008, uh, Lehman brothers was like three weeks later. Wow. So, uh, we got extremely lucky in the timing. No the, kidding. The bank actually told us you would, uh, we wouldn't have been able to lend you the money at all. We wouldn't have had the money to lend to you if you hadn't closed that day. Wow. So, uh, um, we ended up, uh, having, it was, it was really a, a bizarre situation because we bought this property. We had already started the demolition. So the property was worth less because once you, once you buy a property and start doing serious yeah. work, it actually goes down in value. Yeah. And sometimes up. the bank won't finance it if you do too much demo, right? Well, if they, if they, you, you give them a plan up front and they'll, and they okay. are comfortable with it as long as you can complete it. They want to make sure you have the money to complete it. The, um, so we, we did the demo. And then the market collapsed and the bank couldn't do anything about it because if they had taken the asset back, they were taking a, an asset that was worth less than we paid for it mm. back after um, the uh, uh, market collapsed. So it was worth even less. Yeah. The, the thing was um, uh, we were, you know, everything was going perfect from our perspective because everybody else stopped building. So all of these contractors had nothing to do. Oh, so, so you, uh, you got, got some better really, labor rates, really good deals and really good, uh, wait, the entire renovation took nine months Yeah, and it was a, it was a, uh, to the studs the the, the original, the building when we bought it still had. Yeah. So you had plenty of labor if you got it done in nine oh, months. Yeah. <laughs> but when we bought it, the building still had functioning knob and tube wire, which if you know, it's like the 1920s where the two wires run very far apart inside of these, uh, ceramic Wow. Tubes. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, nowadays that's extremely dangerous, but, yeah. um, when that, was, when was that building built originally? 26. 26. Mm -hmm. Okay. We did what's uh, called a historic tax credit syndication. So the, uh, when you do a, a, a sensitive historic project like that, um, uh, the feds and the state will give you a, a good deal of, um, tax credits, but they're basically for, for it, people in my position, they're basically useless. I mean, if I had a, if I had a ton of money and I had a ton of income, yeah, sure. But, um, it would, it would take me 50 years to burn them off. Whereas a large. So the tax credits are a, a lot like depreciation, like the, they're much better than depreciation. Yeah. They're dollar for dollar. So if okay. you, if you owe a dollar in taxes, you can use one of these tax credits. It's not like depreciation where but you could never get that much credit is what you're it, saying. It would take forever for me to get that kind of credit. Wow. So what we did is we, we, um, sold the tax credits, uh, for a discount to, um, in, the, in our case, it was Schneider electric or square D basically, um, the buyers of these credits are widely held C corps or publicly traded companies. And they, they buy them at a discount because they, so let's say they buy them at 70 cents. You know, they got a hundred percent down on their taxes for 70 cents. Yeah. So everybody wins and the, uh, the government wins because the, uh, they get the historic preservation, but they don't have to do anything to monitor it because for the five years that, uh, is the holding period for these credits, the, um, credit buyer, 
or Schneider Electric, yeah. is ch- making sure that the that the that the historic character is preserved because if it isn't, they lose all the credits retroactively. So they are basically the they can the government can run this massive program by offloading all of the work onto yeah. everybody who's doing the program, and uh, it works out pretty well. Yeah, that's crazy. So I'm really curious the the transition from being a, from your perspective, from being a, you and your, your wife owning a lot of single family homes Mm. to getting into like a bed and breakfast style boutique hotel. What, what are the similarities and what are the big differences between the two? Well, um, a a bed and breakfast, except for the fact that everybody's in your house, um, a bed and breakfast is very similar to, uh, rental properties, except it's just in high speed. So as rental properties, you have, say, say you have 10 rental properties, you have 10 guests yeah, and they last for a year, two years, five years, 10 years, whatever, uh, with a, a hotel or a bed and breakfast, you have, let's say 10 guests and they're with you for 24 to 48 hours and you get a new set. Um, but, uh, so the, the, the mindset and the economics, uh, at least at a, 50,000 foot view are, yeah. are very similar now getting down to the basics. Yes. Uh, on the, on the ground, it's very different because uh, I mean, you're, you have to interact with a whole bunch of right. new people. Well, one's like a, one's in the hospitality industry and another, I don't think a lot of people think of landlords as in the <laughs> hospitality industry. Perhaps they should be categorized there. I mean, it's in a very small way. We brought in some elements of hospitality to make the rental property business better. Right. And then, so we, then when we went to the, um, full hospitality business, um, we had at least a little bit of an idea of what we were doing. Of course, we were completely naive. And first day we had worked in a hospital, a real hospitality business was the day we opened the, the one in Durham. <laughs> but in the first day we worked in a restaurant was the day we opened the one in Cary. Yeah. It seems like you guys care a lot about restoring historical things. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from, from, from your guys' perspective? Like, what is it about restoring something historical that seems so romantic to you guys it's it's more interesting it, it, it it's uh i think you have you have this 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 building that's that's there mm-hmm. and it's um uh well for me it's it's it i can't i won't, can't speak to my wife she um i think she's uh slightly different than i am but in this case it's you have a you have a puzzle and you're constrained and so you have you have to you need to do these things but you, yeah but you can't do these other things. Whereas if you're building new, you have a blank sheet of paper, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. And that has its own set of problems. But with historic, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get when you take out that wall. I mean, is that, a, yes, you can, you can sell, yeah, it's probably load bearing. It's probably not, but you don't really know that, yeah. huh, somebody, somebody hid um, a, a massive junction box back there that, you know, <laughs> right. Isn't actually connected to the main electrical system. And so when you slice through the wall, boom, everything explodes. What's the most unusual thing you've discovered? Have you found treasure? <laughs> uh, no, we, we have found some really, really cool, um, old glass bottles, um, from, from like the twenties and thirties. Yeah. Um, they used to kind of leave them in buildings, right? Like yeah. in a wall, mm-hmm. like seltzer bottles where they, so, uh, liquor bottles. Nice. <laughs> what, do they have liquor in them? Oh uh, no, no. Interesting. <laughs> uh, and some old newspapers that were pretty cool, hmm. uh, with like, uh, things that, things that happened in the history of Durham that we, that we knew about yeah. on, on them. Um, that is really cool yeah. to find something that's like a piece of history. Also seeing that, seeing it's, it is a bit of a, uh, like an archaeological dig to see how these old buildings were constructed. I mean, nowadays everybody knows that two by fours are not two by four. Yeah. Well, they were in the twenties. Oh, and so you can't go fix something in a wall because <laughs> so it's not the same it's size. It's a little bit different. You got to shim everything out. Because people probably milled their own wood back then. Right? Yeah, yeah, and they, everybody had like a big old farm, and they just milled <laughs> their own wood. And just not just yeah, just take out the trees on the on the land that you're building the house on is enough. Um, but uh, uh, things like that um, were just interesting to to come across and yeah. see. Um, and and then, you like the puzzle aspect of it, like yeah. putting it together. Well, how do you how do you take that, respect it, make it make it visible? Don't don't hide it, but also add 
all the modern stuff you have to add. Like yeah. you have to put in so many outlets in each room and they have to be with Romex and you have to, so you have to cut into like the walls in this place. It, it, it They weren't just plaster. It wasn't like lath and plaster. Like everybody thinks you see these wooden slabs. Yeah. No, it was ship lath, which is like that. Um, the side, the, um, uh, the, like, Right. Chip and Joanna Gaines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this I bought from Lowe's. So probably not the same stuff you're talking. I'm not even sure this is wood. Oh, yeah. Tongue, <laughs> it, 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 it was basically tongue and groove hardwood floor up the walls. Yeah. Um, and so. That's sturdy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't, you, you can't go through that um, <laughs> without a, even a sledgehammer will just bounce off. So you gotta, you gotta go in with a drill and then take a uh, saber saw and start slicing it out. Once you get a couple of boards loose, yeah. then you can start prying them off. But of course, understand you're prying off something that is not, that is still, you know, underneath an inch of concrete plaster right. too. So. And probably an inch thick. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're very, they're very sturdy. So, um, did you guys ever, um, when you're removing or demoing stuff, did you guys ever do the thing? I hear people in their homes do this all the time. Like when they take something out, they keep some of it and turn it into something else. It's kind of like a, Oh yeah. A piece of furniture or some kind of tribute to the historical nature of what they found. Yeah. We've done that. We've kept some, uh, we've kept, uh, we've kept some bricks and turned those into little, uh, uh, plant areas. Yeah. Um, we've, uh, some of the wood we kept, um, and, uh, made it a little, uh, like a frame that we left in one of the houses. Um, and, uh, one of the other nice things was when we were doing the King's Daughters, we had all of this copper wire, like huge cables. Yeah. Um, and I've kept a couple of those and uh, plan to give those to my, my two sons when they're old enough to understand what it is. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> so the copper was thicker back then. Well, these were the main, these were the main, these the main ones. So they were that pretty were, big. Yeah, about an inch across. That's crazy. Mm. Welcome to the middle part of the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Joe has something he wants to share today. The, the middle part is usually the good part. Like it think is. Of an Oreo. Or a hamburger. Or a Twinkie. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the mid, the tasty middle. Yummy. Yeah. Let's get it. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, behavioral science. And so the, the idea is it's a lot easier to, to work with your human nature than work against it. And I like setting goals, but I don't think I'm the best goal setter. But I have goals and I pay attention to that. And most of the time I reach goals. So I see that the value in setting goals, but basically take and rework your goals, put them in present language, use the present participle verb tense, like you're doing them now. Give yourself credit for what you've done, as well as talk about how it makes you feel to give yourself that encouragement to keep going. Hmm. So I, like that. I thought that was a big difference for me and it made a big difference in my kind of morning ritual of going over my goals. Well, that's the challenge. So work on your goals. If you, if you have your goals, just try that exercise, put them in present tense and describe how it makes you feel and do that today and let us know how it goes in the comments of uh, guys who do stuff.com. Click, click, click. Peace Back out. to this episode, we'll call it. That puzzle solving nature, because I'm curious. So you started out in rentals, then you moved into the King's Daughters, which is now hospitality. And then how did you get from there to the maintenance, in, which led to opening a restaurant, opening a bar, having a spa, mm -hmm. like all these new business ventures. Is it all for you? Is it all driven by like the puzzle? Like that sounds, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, the, the, That's part of it. Um, so after we had been open with the King's Daughters for about uh, three, four years, uh, Ed Goff came to us. He was a, at the time, he was the, one of the town managers of Cary, not, not, not the, the town manager, but I guess the assistant or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, not sure of his real, his full title, but he came to us and said, uh, we would be very interested in you all looking at downtown Cary for your next project. So we did, we came down, we looked, we liked it and, uh, uh, a lot of back and forth and then, uh, put it together and, yeah. and bought it and built it. Yeah. Well, it turns out there was a, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Cause I think a couple of things about the maintenance, it matches downtown carry, which is really cool. And I think it was kind of like somebody needed to start all the new stuff that everybody had been talking about for a long time. Mm. And without a hotel, I don't think downtown carry could become the destination that I think it's going to start being for people, like for people to come and stay and 
and they got all that crazy stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen the the city's website of the the virtual fly through of the park that's going mm. in behind the main inn, but man, it looks cool. Even if they only execute like 50%, it's going to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and then the, of course the new library that's supposed to be open in the fall, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the parking garage. And the parking garage, which is always tricky because if you've ever been to like a food truck rodeo or anything in downtown Gary, it's like, all right. Get there early. Yeah. <laughs> Just where the hell do we spot. park here? <laughs> and everything's like, you yeah. can't park here. And the only parking spots are that kitchen and bath place that say you can't park there unless you're a customer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and well, yeah, parking is, has so far not been too much of a problem for us. Uh, we have the. You guys valet. valet. Yeah. yeah. Oh, valet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And anybody can use it. You don't have to be coming to the hotel. Oh, no, I didn't know that. There's a pro tip if you live in Cary. Yeah, just come on, use our valet. Come on. It'd be nice if you came in the hotel and, you know, had a, had a drink or yeah. bought, bought them. But, uh, you know, don't have to. We, we, it's it's free for everybody. Yeah. You guys have friendly greeters there. I noticed that in my time. Mm-hmm. It's, everyone's happy, it seems. Yeah. If you could, Colin, if you could rewind and kind of revert back to when you had just maybe done your first or second house. What lessons have you learned today that you wish that you could go back and tell yourself that would either maybe save you time, save you some heartache, help you fast forward in your success? <laughs> um, well, probably uh, it, spend a, spend more time thinking about how not to sell the properties and uh, instead keep them and figure out how to keep moving forward without uh, selling as much as possible. That. Um, the selling the properties made us made it absolutely possible for us to move forward the way we, we wanted to. Right. But um, at some to some extent, it was also a an easy uh, an easier way than trying to figure out how to re-leverage them and keep them. Because if we yeah. if we'd kept them, that's you know that's like you said, that's more income that you, that would be coming in. Um, but uh, we didn't do that, and it, it's worked out. But at the same time, it would have been nice to have a little bit more. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you usually hear that it's buy and hold is where the where the money is to be made in real estate. Um, we happen to. I mean, we we with respect to the our properties in Durham, we it's one of those things that we couldn't have timed it better if we had tried. Yeah, like we bought it. The you bottom. guys won the lottery of timing. There. Yeah, <laughs> we, we bought at the bottom when money was cheapest, um, and you know, back in two thousand and five, you you had a pulse. You didn't even have to be human, and you could get a loan. Yeah, um, I remember like it was crazy easy back then. Yeah, You'd be like, I have a job. Sure, I have three houses. Go for it. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the funny story about the uh, closing on the on the big um, uh, big block purchase. The banker, his due diligence was Google. He said, mm. "You Google well," because I was a, I was a basically, I was on the faculty. <laughs> yeah, is that a first, Joey? First time you heard Google-able. that? You Google well. Yeah, you Google well. You know, Joe, Joe you Google well. Is anybody Colin Crossman, <laughs> Google me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that out, that worked out well, and uh, uh, that. Uh, but we, at the time, it was just really easy. Yeah. Nowadays, it's going to be a lot more difficult. So I don't think we could have um, we could do what we did any other way than we did now. But yeah. back in 2008, before the collapse, we probably could have gotten away with keeping more. Yeah. Um, but um, but we didn't. So there's something I saw on your website that I thought was just perfectly put. After kind of learn, learn a little bit more about you. That uh, it was talking about your guys' journey together, you and Deanna. Uh, it's a story of falling in love and following your dreams. <laughs> so now you guys are kind of in this mode where you met over this common love for restoring old houses and fell in love. And now you're at the place where you own multiple boutique inns and you guys host a lot of weddings. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, is that kind of like a full circle thing for you? You guys really enjoy that? Do you get to be around for the weddings? Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're both generally around. Um, Are either one of you licensed so you can do the wedding? No, no. Neither of us do that. Uh, the, the, mm, I'm, uh, our, our actual duty is during, during weddings is I'm, I'm the IT guy. So if anything with the, with the audio or I got lighting you. or whatever, so I have to be on call for that. But, um, and Deanna is operation. So she's trying to make sure the food gets out and yeah, yeah. If either, it, um, I can usually step away and do other things, but if she steps away, then it's 
(laughs) (laughs) I saw an article that came across my RSS feed the other day, which still exists apparently, which is now just news from Apple. But uh, it was from Mashable and it said that they'd pulled all these wedding photographers and they asked them if they had noticed signs of whether or not a marriage was going to make it or not by the way they acted during the wedding. And some of the stuff was really comical. They're like, if they're not on the same page and you can tell this at the cake thing, like if, if one smears the cake and the other one doesn't, Mm-mm, not good. <laughs> like if they're not in the same step with stuff like that. I'm curious. Have you guys noticed anything like that with uh? Because you, you guys, you've probably hosted a bunch of weddings. Oh, we've we've. Oh, jeez. You probably it's seen like, some serious bridezilla kind of stuff. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that too much, but uh, I will. You say, can change the names to protect yeah, the innocent. <laughs> innocent. I, I will say that uh, over the ten years um, that we've been doing this, uh, the. The King's Daughters has a reputation of being a great little spot. And that, that hotel did uh, 30 to 40 weddings a year. Yeah, because at 17 year. rooms, you can rent the whole thing mm-hmm. and, and make it a big, like, celebration yeah. party thing. Oh, we, yeah, it was, it was like wedding headquarters. People as For small weddings, we'd have everything in-house. And for large weddings, they'd put the wedding party at our place and everybody else would stay in other hotels. Mm. And then they'd do one, like the rehearsal or the reception at our place and yeah. everything else somewhere else. Um, but in all cases, it's a ton of people. Right. So we've had uh, uh, easily 200 300 weddings over the course of 10 years, um, probably more than that. Um, and uh, on, on at least one occasion, we've had two weddings for the same person. <laughs> oh, special. Hey, yeah. people love repeat business. Nothing like repeat That's business. Good, That's yeah. a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one industry where you kind yeah. of don't want repeat business. Yeah. I like, would send oh. a follow up card to that person and say, hey, just in case there's round three, you know where to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, you two, yeah. <laughs> well, two, <very> much <laughs> yeah. That's great. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Give That's me a discount. The, you guys will just- be the first hotel chain to offer that discount. <laughs> Buy two discount. weddings, I get one that. free. They yeah. must be your wedding. <laughs> That's great. But they, uh, uh, they, they were, um, they were, they were great. Um, we definitely have some opinions about things of what we see, but, yeah. uh, uh, we'll keep those to ourselves just because <laughs> <laughs> nobody's perfect. And the main inn is a great place. Like if you're listening to this and you're about to get married and you're looking for a venue, mm. um, I've seen some of the photos online. It seems like it's an amazing place to to oh, tie yeah. the knot for sure. Uh, people people really love it. Uh, we we can do everything from uh, having people do the whole the whole ceremony, reception, rehearsal dinner, all of that. Yeah, because you get like a private room off the back mm-hmm. off the restaurant, so you could have like your reception back there. And you guys got that beautiful terrace mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. that I see. Sometimes it's covered, yep. so you kind of got some heaters out there and keeping it warm. Yeah, right now we got it. We got it tented because it's a uh, little transitional temperatures. It can be a little chilly. It's going to be eighty today. Um, yeah, started at forty. Yeah, welcome to Cary <laughs> in the in the early fall, in the early spring. <laughs> but it's all. Also, you know, you never know this time of year if it's going to rain. So keep the tent up and yeah, um, yeah, it works out real well. So what's next for you guys? What's the next chapter look like? Well, back uh, middle of last year, we purchased a hotel out in Vegas. Uh, and Ooh. I can, uh, the reason why. Won it in a game of blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> the, we, we've always been looking for uh, a place in the mountains. Mm-hmm. And we were looking um at the mountains of North Carolina in uh, Asheville, Hendersonville area. Mm-hmm. Um, we, found a, we found a little spot in Hendersonville that we liked, but after s- several months of uh, figuring it out, the, it's, the, the town isn't ready yet. And the reason is because there's, um, d- it's difficult to get from Asheville to Hendersonville. It's, yeah. the, the road is uh, narrow and so it gets clogged a lot. So there's a lot of traffic. Um, that, uh, in, in addition to that, Hendersonville is about a five hour, four and a half to five hour drive from Cary. Las Vegas is a four hour flight and the hotel is a 45 minute drive from the airport. So it's faster. So it's actually faster <laughs> to get to the hotel in Vegas than it would be the one in North Carolina mountains. That makes sense. And yeah. uh, there's just this thing about when it's a hundred degrees and a hundred percent humidity Going out to Vegas, yeah, when you land at the airport, it's 120, <laughs> okay? But it's 0% humidity. Yeah. Then yeah. you drive up the mountain, and it's 90 and zero yeah. with no biting insects. Yeah. It's 
amazing. Wow. The, it, now, so this place is, when I say- So Vegas, how many rooms is this one? This is 62. 62. Yeah. Um, the, when I say Vegas, it's that's a little- um, uh, kind of like a, a rounding error. Yeah. It's uh, the city of Vegas. Like we all say we live in Raleigh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just easier for people. Yeah. Anybody, anybody out of the area. Yeah. yeah it's just Raleigh. Um, but uh, the, the city of Vegas is physically very large, kind of like Raleigh. It's very, very big area. Um, but it's actually carved up just like the Raleigh metro areas into small communities. This is not even in one of those communities. It's in the county. Um, 20 minutes from the edge of town, uh, but at 6,500 feet of elevation. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's skiing up there in the winter, lots of hiking in the summer. And because of the elevation change, um, there's about a 30 degree temp- temperature dip drop from, yeah. the, from the valley. So I bet the views are pretty amazing they too. Oh, yeah. You can't, yeah, you can't. Uh, it's the only hotel on the mountain, and you, you, can't, you can't get those views yeah. <laughs> anywhere else. Is there a name of that mountain? It's Mount Charleston. And Mount the, Charleston. And the hotel is the Retreat on Charleston Peak. It's just poetry, isn't it? <laughs> the Retreat on Charleston Peak. That's fun to say. It is fun to say. I'm imagining <laughs> it right now. It's, it's in Nevada. All right, let's go. Yeah, it's yeah. four hours. <laughs> uh, we can be there by dinner, guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because remember, there's also a three-hour time difference. So you leave here at one and you land at two or three. <laughs> we can be there by lunch, guys. It's magical. <laughs> Last time we went to Vegas, my wife didn't want to convert to the time change. So we're like playing blackjack at 3 a.m. <laughs> so we just woke up, but everybody else that's there, it just made it a lot of fun because they've been there since the previous day and they're just yeah. really fun to talk to. It's a great people watching out in yeah. Vegas, man. Yeah, it is. It's a great, it's a great town. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of, uh, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting town. Um, the, the strip, you know, you go there, you see it, you do, a, do it a couple times or um, whatever. Uh, but after you, they, I, okay, there is a whole lot more to Vegas than the Strip. Yeah. Like you, the Strip is a, is a tiny little area. You leave that and it is a, it is a, a great town just like any, like, just like here. Uh, great people, very, um, uh, lots of business, lots of uh, startups actually. Yeah. Um, really? Mm-hmm. The Vegas area. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. A lot of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No bugs. Are they growing? Is it? Is it? Because I know the Triangle. What's the number? Like 120 people a day move to the Triangle. Something crazy. Well, the triangle, like that? 65 to Wake County a day, isn't it? Or um, um, yeah, well, 65 to like Wake that. County, but uh, the Triangle includes Chapel Hill and Durham. So 100 to the, the Triangle doesn't seem surprising. Mm-hmm. Vegas is about the same way. It's it's growing very very fast. Interesting. Um, but uh, a, couple, a couple differences. The the county Clark Vegas is in Clark County, Nevada, and it's actually I, I was I was corrected. It's Nevada, Nevada, that's Nevada. What, that's what the people there told. Oh, me you got to say it with a southern Nevada. accent. Nevada, I'm on to Nevada. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll come back now. You know, Nevada's <laughs> waiting. <laughs> they um, Clark County is the size of Connecticut. It's huge. Wow, um, and has uh, its its population is um, I think four to five million. Mm-hmm. They got. And the Vegas Knights, the new hockey team, so just like us with the hockey team, but they also just got the Raiders. Um, so they've got two professional teams. The Raiders haven't, uh, the, the stadium is still under construction, but it's going up fast. Hmm. So yeah. out there, they're, they're, uh, they, they can build <clears throat> basically all year round. <laughs> That's right. So you're excited about that. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. oh yeah, and we 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 knew the Raiders were coming when we got the uh, when we looked at the hotel out there. Man, the Raiders move all the time, don't they? They do. My neighbor's a giant Raiders fan. He's got like <laughs> his Raiders stuff all over. Yeah, uh, but I think that was originally when they were in California. Was when he was. A well, they were fan. they were in Oakland and then they were L A. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they have moved twice in that state. Yeah. Where were they when Bo Jackson was a Raider? I don't know. I think they were in L A. Or no, Oakland. But they always, they always had the black and the white cross bones, right? Like the, the mm-hmm. pirate. Yes. Yeah. I don't think yeah, I don't think that's changed. And in fact, uh, uh, all the all the livery that you see around Vegas is the same. Nice. Mm-hmm. It matches. Good. So, what piece of advice would you give somebody just starting out, uh, dipping their toe in real estate? Mm-hmm. Let's say he's sitting next to you and he owns one property. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, uh, okay. It's, um, at least how we did it. Look for the dogs, look for the, look for the houses that nobody else wants. As long as, okay. Location is everything, of course. Mm -hmm. 
if it's in the good, if it's in a, uh, an area that that you feel is up and coming, don't buy something in an established area. Okay, that's uh, you can you can make that work. It's hard because you're going to be paying top dollar for it, and um, you're not going to be able to uh, you know get a nice differential on it unless it's a, unless it's in bad shape. So yeah. if if it's in a great area and the house or the property is run down and you can see it, see that it, you have uh, you can put in say an extra ten or twenty percent on the purchase price. And then move the value up fifty percent. Okay, that's right. the one you want. Um, so similarly, the Wall Town area where we were, where we bought, we could tell even back in two thousand five that the values were going to explode because right. Which is probably why you're like, I wish I would have held on to it yeah. because those property values now, yeah, like if you were to run a percentage on them, it's insane. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah those 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 things are going for uh, north of two hundred now, and that's a bit just because of their location. And uh, it was it was a very rough neighborhood in the nineties. It was uh, this is right next, you know, but sandwiched between Duke University and NC Science and Math and NC School of the Arts. Yeah, um, and uh, it was a, it was a it was a pretty violent neighborhood in the nineties. A lot of that disappeared in early two thousands uh, due to. Uh, New policing, uh, Duke University taking a strong initiative, but the stigma, the the you know the mind share of everyone looking at Durham was like, don't go to Walltown. Hmm. So we went to Walltown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, it, that's why the house, the, everything was. So, so look for things that are either in areas where the you know the zeitgeist doesn't match up to the you know what you see on the ground. Or where everything is great, but the property is in bad shape. Yeah. Now, if the property is in bad shape, then you have to be able to evaluate it. You need you need either a good eye on your own or a good um, inspector to make sure that you know you, you don't want to buy something that's going to fall down. You want bones to be good. It doesn't matter how bad it looks cosmetically. Like if 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 there's like this giant chartreuse wall, it's gonna dis, it's gonna lower the price of the asset a ton because nobody wants to see a giant chartreuse wall. Well, that's like 75 bucks in a gallon of paint. Right. Right. So, um, things like that. Look for, look for the things that, uh, most people are going to be turned off by, but are actually not a problem. Um, avoid, <laughs> avoid polybutylate pipe at all costs. <laughs> What's that? Polybutylate P- pipe? P- uh, PB. It's this old, it's this piping system that was put in in the eighties. And if it hasn't, um, uh, catastrophically failed yet, it will. So <laughs> that's one thing that, yeah, if you want to do that, then you're another reason to get a good home inspector. Yeah. Mm. Pe- uh, PEX and copper are safe, but PB, yeah, avoid that stuff. My house is uh, partially aluminum wiring. The house that we're in now. Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing for um, houses built between the 30s and the 70s. Um, this is late 70s. The house yeah. we're in. The uh, uh, aluminum wire is um, that's that's a concern. It, you you can uh, it could be mostly because it's difficult to fix, um, but it's not it's not like PB where um, you know it, it'll just all of a sudden. Fail. What is that transport? The PV pipe. That's water. Water pipe. Yeah, okay. It's water pipe. Um, the the worst thing for uh, at least in our experience, the worst thing uh, that can happen in a house, uh, aside from um, somebody seriously overloading a circuit and starting a fire, but as long as you know nobody's being completely stupid, uh, is water damage because you may not know that's happening. It could go on for years behind the wall, mm. and then. You, f- you only discover it when something falls apart. Yeah. And so. our old friend Stacky Botris appears under the washing machine, right? The old mold. <laughs> yeah. Mold. And of course, in this part of the country, mold is a big problem. But yeah. at least at least electrical, you know, if, if it's, if it's, if it's going to be a problem, it's going to tell you pretty quick, at least in my experience. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So you guys kind of took the approach where you grew fast. You think doing it over again, you would have gone slower and just tried to hold on to everything? Yeah, a little bit slower. The uh, uh, exponential growth is, it's, it's good and all, but it's also uh, very... Yeah. Uh, and your guys' story could have worked out a lot different if mm-hmm. the timing would have been slightly different for you yeah. guys. Yeah, we, uh, cer- certain elements of our of timing for us were in, were really, really great, and other elements were really, really not great. 
Um, I think on balance, everything has been, has worked out pretty well. Yeah. And that's, that's the one thing that every, that you gotta, you gotta, if you're going to get into running your own business, you have to always believe that everything's going to turn out okay. Because if you don't, you're going to, you're just going to, you know, you never, you'll never sleep. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a bit of faith. It's a bit of trust. It's a bit of, um, just, uh, <laughs> blindness to reality sometimes, but, <laughs> but at the same time, it's, it's things generally work out. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, everybody, uh, especially if you have something that where everybody wants to see it succeed. So, right. And I think that's the maintenance. in. I think people love that place. I know I do. Mm-hmm. I was really excited. I love it when stuff's getting built and I loved watching it go up because we were close to it. And, um, I think it's made downtown look really cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being on the podcast. And thank you guys for making downtown carry cool. Yeah. If you guys haven't checked out the Maiden Inn yet, they got a great restaurant. They've got a great bar. Valet, even if you aren't Valet, staying there. Valet, even if you aren't staying there. You guys need to go don't check this out. To, don't even have to eat in the restaurant. Just if you, if you want to go downtown and you need a valet, just go. Use us. Uh, it's okay. Um, but I uh, would, would love people to stop in. But yeah. uh, we do have a really great brunch where... Um, I think uh, somebody noticed that we were now one of the top, if not the top, brunch spot in Cary. Oh, really? Mm. So take that, Briggs. The, uh, <laughs> I remember I, we, we went there, my wife and I went there once, and I got a hamburger with a fried green tomato on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was legit. It was yeah. so like pimento cheese and a fried green tomato. It was so good. It was really good. Well, the atmosphere <laughs> is insane as well. Yeah. It's like when I heard that the BNI group is meeting there, I, that's half the reason I joined the group because of the location. And that was so exciting to go there all the time because I'm always bringing out of town people to the maintenance and just yeah. to see it as we do a tour of downtown. It's like, yeah. let's and go you there. Guys, you guys got a really cool thing in your basement that I got to see once, but there's a room down there that has a, like it's seating for like one, but oh, the yeah. floor is one of those really cool, Ooh. like they put down pennies yep. and then poured epoxy on it. What? So the whole floor that. looks like copper. That's basement yep. level? Like elevator to go to the basement like or one, stairway? Yeah, when you oh, walk okay. in, you go down one. Yeah, that's, oh. that's our wine cellar. And uh, it's, it's um, we have, it's a, it's a room that'll seat about 12 to 14. I think we can get 14 in there, but... Um, it's kind of a, we, we use it as a private meeting room. If somebody really wants to be private, it's back of house. So you can't even, uh, you have to know that it's there. You can't just yeah. go down to the basement. Oh, we just spoiled it. Sorry. Wait, do you have a dumb waiter? <laughs> we do hey, have a dumb we, waiter. We, we call have... him Jeff and that's rude. <laughs> hey, lay off. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> you took it there. What? Colin, I want to hear about the dumb waiter. We do have a dumb waiter. Unfortunately, it is currently not functioning. Uh, we, we, we're waiting on a part, but dumb uh, your dumb waiter needs a part. <laughs> yeah. What part? Oh, okay, so, but yeah, but it's there's hope for the dumb waiter. There's hope. There's hope. Is there yeah. an ETA on the dumb waiter? Because I really I was in a Pinter play uh, <laughs> called the Dumb Waiter. Harold Pinter has a play called the Dumb Waiter. It's genius. You should have you considered doing the Dumb Waiter a show of the Dumb Waiter like a scene from the Dumb Waiter and then that, using the Dumb Waiter. That would be interesting. I, I have not. I didn't even. Are know you there getting was such a sponsored thing. by Dumb Waiter? <laughs> you said it a lot. I'm excited about this. It's like a surrealist sort of, I love the dumb waiter. Anyway, that's awesome. So we have an ET on the dumb waiter, maybe this summer. Maybe hopefully next time. This summer. Maybe hopefully next time this you'll summer. show Josh and I the cool copper floor because oh, he yeah. hasn't seen it yet. And I only yeah. saw it once and I, I saw it on Pinterest and I thought about doing it in a room in my house, but then yeah. I like counted the cost of what it would look like. Did you do that? Did you? Not, well, we, we all, uh, a, a good portion of our staff pitched in and it, yeah. uh, the funny thing about it is. Um, is there any like Easter eggs in there? Is like oh, one, yeah. one's heads up, one's. Uh, well, they're, they're, the the One's pennies themselves cheese are all up and down, but uh, <laughs> we have uh, there's there's uh, a three pence piece. There's uh, uh, basically pennies from uh, several different countries. There's a quarter. There's a nickel. There's a dime, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, there's just uh, there's a bunch of different things that are, that are embedded in it. But uh, when we when we realized we're going to do this floor, we want to do it really nice. We want to do something unique and interesting. We could put wood down there. It would it would it would have been interesting, but. Hardwood floor is about, oh, I don't know, five dollars, six dollars a square foot, something yeah. like that. Um, but with all the setup costs and everything, it would have been, it, the hardwood floor would have run probably about seven hundred fifty to a thousand bucks. Yeah, it's crazy that it's pretty affordable to do a penny floor. Oh yeah, well, it was five hundred and fifty six dollars <laughs> in, in pennies. In pennies, yeah. The epoxy so, probably cost more than the actually pennies. Actually, it did. So yeah. just to clarify, how do we? How does one get reservations there? For that one, it's a that that's you have uh, to know events. somebody. So that's events. That's events. So you'd want yeah. to go through um, through a big uh, party, Margaret, and uh, yeah, 
uh, Margaret would be able to set aside that room. That'd for be you. great for like a big family reunion or something. Cool. Yeah, twelve uh, people. He's a twelve, 12 people. people. Twelve people. Uh, uh, yeah, ten. To, uh, well, anything more than uh, well, any anything up to about twelve, fourteen, I think would be tight. But I think we can do it. That's like Last Supper style, like twelve yeah. people. Will yeah, it's weird because yeah. they all sit on the same side of the table, just oh. inefficient. But. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's a, it's a. Uh, we've had birthday parties down there. Yeah. We've had um, just like. We've had business meetings down there where they really wanted to be private. Sure. We've had lots of different things down there. Yeah. Do you mic it when there's private business meetings? Do you mic it? <laughs> That's right. The That's private wonderful. business meeting. Yeah. It's 12 go in, six come out. <laughs> well, the dumb waiters <laughs> like that. They actually play. You got two guys that are hitmen waiting for orders, and the orders keep coming down the dumb waiter, and it's like, okay, it's ready, it's not ready. And they know when they're going to go make their hit. You know, <laughs> I'm so excited about that. <laughs> well, the dumb waiter is right next to the. Uh, uh, the wine cellar. So I, can, I, can I have a picture with it even before it's ready? <laughs> I think we can, we can probably arrange that. Colin, thank you so much for being yeah, here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank I'm you. really looking forward to, I, I hope continued success for your venture coming up in Vegas. And thank you so much for, if you guys haven't checked out the, the mate and in and carry, you should go check it out. We'll go grab links. a meal there. Yep. Look below for links. You can find it. It's yep. Google him. Oh yeah. Google me. Google Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. Well, Joe, that was an enthralling encounter with a local real estate mogul, a humble guy. Gives you something to aspire to, right, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. He really dropped some like timing. I mean, listen to the timing in that yeah. their their story, right? Yeah. I kind of was thinking when he was, is he like the Mr. Magoo of real estate timing? Like <laughs> they just ducked when the bullet came through and they just turned right when the accident happened to the left. Yeah. Like that was some, su- that's good, clean living right there. Yeah, man. Great timing. Supreme judgment. And I love the, um, just the practicality of it. Like, what do you think is a good takeaway? from from this episode. Yeah, I think a good takeaway would be long-term thinking and just strategizing and leveraging before acting on things. Slow down. It's the motion of the ocean. (laughs) There you go. Yeah, I like that, right? The motion of the ocean. Colin, thanks for being awesome and sharing this stuff with us. Yeah, and check us out at guyswhodostuff.com. Leave us a question uh, that we might feature on an upcoming episode. Follow us on Instagram and uh, we would love to hear from you on the blog. Always, people. Bye. Later. Bye.